Now, Paula, and I, again, I, I don't want to speak over any public thing that she said publicly, but I'll just relate what she said at the time. And she was still terrified at the point that she went into the woods. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, she, um, she was so terrified that finally Ricardo turned to her and said, Paula, you have to calm down. They cannot, they cannot communicate with us if you are in this kind of condition. You can't, you've got to calm down. Yeah, she has said and, that publicly, um, yeah. Okay, all right, good, perfect. Okay, then I can corroborate that part of, of her, her testimony, okay, from, from yeah. that event. So um, uh, one thing that, that, that Paula and the others said was that these people seem to be moving in and out of the trees. And I don't, I never understood exactly why they would kind of walk behind the trees and what they were doing. Um, it seemed to me from what they told me was that Antorell stood in a fixed position, which was <clears throat> completely consistent with my position in the field with where he was standing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he would have been standing at the very tree where I saw the light going straight up the tree. The light didn't go into the sky. I didn't notice that, but I could see that the tree was illuminated um, in this bluish haze. Um, anyway, they, they communicated, and I don't remember all of what was what took place in that communication, um, but I, I, I do recall Paula being very specific. Um, and she said that um, before... Uh, when this whole affair ended, uh, she said, Antorell took took a minute to step, oh, he, like he was going to turn away. He took a half step to turn away, and he turned back and looked at her and gave her a very, very, very stern look. Mm -hmm. Very stern. Yeah, she well, said he that wasn't publicly. pleased. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was not pleased. He was not pleased with where she was. So um, anyway... Um, and I don't recall, Grant, and I'm so sorry. I don't, re I don't recall all of what was said. Paula did interview me uh, the next day um, and I, because I was so transformed spiritually by what had happened. Uh, and uh, actually, it was not the next day. It was, would have been the day after that. We had we'd actually stopped at the hotel. We had, she, Paula had had that experience. On the drive between Northern California through Nevada, she interviewed me about um, and, and recorded it, and uh, that interview actually um, went on went, in, went on newsstands in in Italy and was on news corners in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I was just absolutely filled with um, just a, an overawe and a, a heightened sense of spirituality after that, and and. Uh, during the event, you know, Grant, it it didn't, and I I I I I will attempt to say this humbly. I I don't mean to um, self promote at all. It, it did, I didn't seem to get a message, but it seemed to energize what I already understood. <clears throat> it, it it seemed to heighten it, it seemed to heighten my sense of spirituality and things that I had already come to realize and to learn before this event, mm -hmm. and so. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 because of what I'd seen both weekends, seen them in the sky, I'd seen their, their essence. I'd seen their essence, if you will, in the, from from the field, and then and then the testimony of what had happened. Uh, it, it was as if I had been there. It was as if I had experienced it for myself, and uh, somehow, um, it. Um, I, I I was I was just energized. I was uh, uh, this a spiritual um, goodness. It was a, a spiritual expansion, if you will. It was a pretty a pretty phenomenal experience. And 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 I and I, I I don't mean to jump ahead or outside of this story, but I <clears throat> I will just say an outlier here is I I, I was in Atacama uh, last year, oh. and um and 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 that experience continued in Chile in in uh, the northern desert there in Atacama. And a, and a Atacama Desert. I mean, it, it continued, and I, I had a, another experience that yet confirmed Ricardo's authenticity, if you will, uh, and 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 uh, not that I needed to relate that back to Shasta, uh, can, because can, I can was. Can you talk uh, about that? Because that's one of the things that other people have told me is that this this is not the the last event in their life, almost like no. the the event follows no. them around now. So can you t talk about Atacama and what happened there? Absolutely. Um, uh, so, 
we went down to Chile, um, and this would have been September 2016, and. Um, uh, it was pretty phenomenal. It was uh, it was a pretty nice experience. We we went down and we 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 stayed in a in a camp uh, in this little uh, little campground in in this little it was in it was in a little town. The campground was literally in the town, and it was pretty rough. <laughs> pretty rough. Uh, I, I wasn't prepared for it to be as rough as it was. I thought we were going to be out camping in some romantic uh, <laughs> mountainside, you know, and it was. Um, Boy, it was one step above. Uh, <laughs> oh, it was not. It was. It didn't smell good. It, it was not pretty. But um, but that's my American standards speaking there. But um, but we were there, and um, uh, we had several meetings, and and Paula spoke, and and Ricardo spoke, and and they did some talks. It was really a peace summit. That is, it was an international peace summit. That's what uh, what Ricardo was doing. And it was it was really nice. It was it was. Um, uh, the conference part that they did was all in Spanish, but it was well done. So uh, nothing. Uh, then we met one night and um, uh, in, in the camp, and um, nothing of great note happened. There were a large number of people there, but nothing of great note happened except that <clears throat> we did see things in the sky. And um, you're probably aware that the uh, Atacama sky is the clearest, purest night sky on Earth because of its elevation high, high elevation, and it's dryness and it's cold, cold temperatures. And that's why a lot of, uh, a lot of um, um, organizations have placed their, their uh, telescopes there. But mm-hmm. uh, from the campground, we didn't see much. But uh, Ricardo, Ricardo said afterwards, he said, um, he said that, that he, the next night he was going to take a smaller group of selected people um, back up this canyon uh, which was, um, oh, I don't know, it was probably five or six miles uh, from that town. Uh, and it, uh, and outside of the town, there, there's nothing. It is barren. It's so high that um, it, it's just dirt mountains. It's all just dirt, uh, just mountains of dirt. Uh, nothing grows. Mm-hmm. So, and, and so we went out there the, the next night. Well, that small group that, in my mind, uh, had been that had been invited was about 70 people that kind of like latched on, latched on, latched on. So about 70 people went out in multiple vans with lots of chairs. <clears throat> but we sat um, in a circle in this little valley of uh, dirt hills. And um, uh, we sat there. There was Paula. There was uh, some different people that, that I, I knew fairly well. Uh, but as we sat there, Grant, um, <clears throat> uh, Ricardo, spoke briefly and then he said that he had been asked to go off up this this hill that actually we had climbed earlier that day but he'd been asked to, to go off on up this hill and um and then some of his key people i think they refer to themselves as antennas I think that's the correct word but they were there so we were seated and these antenna guys were kind of standing up on the outside of the circle and as we looked we could see between us and uh, the hillside, which this hillside kind of formed one side of this little tight little valley that we were in, and we were fairly close to this hillside, but we could see, uh, again, I don't know how to articulate it, but it was like, um, you know, I, I what it reminded me of was the old Star Trek series where they would use a transporter Mm-hmm. And they would begin to appear. They would begin to materialize. Mm-hmm. They would kind of materialize in this kind of little fractionated uh, thingy. <laughs> it reminded me of that, but it was very, very. Uh, it was not very bright. It was very dim, and it was more like sparkles. And that's that's what it reminded me of. And as I said, there, Paula is very intuitive, extremely intuitive. And she said, "Oh my gosh!" She said, "Antorell is right there. He's he's right there." And um, I, I could see that, and it was about it was it kind of was a a human shape, <clears throat> but I didn't have it was dark. I didn't have any gauge for distance or size, so I couldn't. I mean, I, I I've been told he's ten feet tall. What is that? Two over two three meters tall. So, I mean, he's very tall, but I couldn't gauge how tall that was. So Ricardo wanders off. He goes and. Um, 
uh, he came back and it was we've sat there for quite a while for maybe an hour hour and a half I, it was a while but he came back and Ricardo looked like he was in the same trance that Diego Barrera had been in when Diego walked past me in the in the in the field up in and and on Mount Shasta in California he came back and and he looked drained absolutely drained so as we stood there we looked um to kind of the end of this valley uh, one side of it was open with a road that's how we got in and the other side was kind of closed and uh the closed end um uh, had a hill there Grant, we saw two ships take off from the other side of that and they both took off and came right over our heads and this time really low really low over us and they, they, they hovered they waited and then poof and then a second one came and poof there is absolutely no doubt um, no, no doubt that they're real, that they're there, they, they exist well so uh, uh, Ricardo was there, and, and people were, you know, just, you know, uh, <clears throat> they're very respectful of him, very loving and very kind, and they were hugging him and so forth. I went up and gave him a hug, and oh my goodness, I, I hugged him, and he, he put his face against mine, so he touched my cheek, my cheekbone, and my ear. After, uh, and I gave him a hug, and he said something nice, polite to me. Grant, where he touched me on my cheek and my cheekbone and my ear, burned wow. for the rest of the evening. <laughs> burned like like a radiation burn. I mean, it burned. I I didn't hurt. It just it felt like um a very defined fever, if you will, in my ear and on exactly exactly where he had touched. And then he came back and just related the most incredible story. And I couldn't understand totally all of what he said because um, because uh, it was in Spanish. And I tried to get other people. You know, I, I didn't understand fully what he what he talked about, but but I did understand some of the components of it. And um, and part of part of what that visit was about was um, talking about uh, water. You know, and and um, the need for us to protect our water and how that would become a real threat to our planet in the future, that, you know, water was so so key to our survival and so important and so forth. And and they were very, the Putians were very concerned about water. And um, he related a story that he had experienced when he was younger about um, uh, and not even understanding this whole phenomenon and seeing two people at a, in the city where he lived and um, uh, in, in Peru, and uh, they were at this w- junction in the city where the, what was a well or something like that, and they, they, these two people talked to him about the importance of water. So anyway, um, uh, th- that was the event in Chile, and <clears throat> and again, you know, I mean, I witnessed these craft right over our heads. Um, so really, one, two, three, um, you know, in 2015, one week I saw them uh, in Crestone, Colorado. I saw them the following week in Mount Shasta, California. The following year, September of 2016, I see them again, even lower, right over our heads in the Atacama Desert. So, um, and then that experience was so profound. Um, as Ricardo related it that evening, I mean, he had, oh my goodness, it was, uh, it involved dimensions and it involved, uh, I believe it was Evica. And, um, uh, uh, and they, 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 you know, he'd, he'd asked about where exactly Apu was, and um, you know, they, they explained. And he, uh, one of the things that I did understand that evening was that, that they had explained to him that um, uh, Apu was, um, I guess, near off the of Centauri, uh, but dimensionally removed. So, uh, you know, it was. It was very close to us, but maybe in a slightly altered dimension. Uh, and so when and when he had that experience, they they literally took him into their world. And oh my goodness, I can't understand. I, I mean, I can't remember all of uh, what he said, but I can just remember the pictures in my mind as he spoke. And it was absolutely incredible how um, uh, how they took him into that dimension. Was they he stood there and he could see the hills 
and then the hills changed and the sky began to change and then the, the ground underneath his feet began to change and then his environment had changed and there he stood it was it was pretty phenomenal uh, to hear him talk about that so for me I was able to connect the dots if you will from Chile to California to Colorado uh, three places beginning with seas but um, it was pretty pretty incredible what does what, what it mean for you in terms of has your life changed in any way or um, well you know Grant it's um, it, it's interesting um, I I, I've had I've had some uh, I've had some incredible incredible things happen to me, and I, I I'll say, I'll tell you I'm just a peon I'm just a no one but I'm I am someone who who just began to wake up I guess and began to be very concentrated uh, in in my thoughts on on this on these things and I I began having experiences in 2009 uh, when I saw that thing over. The mountains there, uh, you know, close to where you visited, actually. Yeah, I, think Bart's you, house. I think you mentioned it when we were at Bart's house. Yeah, very possibly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had an incredible spiritual experience. I heard a voice in my head very clearly, which gave me peace beyond understanding. Uh, it was a peace that I, for two days, I couldn't shake that peace. That was my first experience. And I, I a very distinct thing was said in my mind. Um, as I just as I had seen that thing in the sky, and then I, I had other events. Um, a huge sphere um, appeared right outside of the airplane when I was on a flight from Phoenix to um, to JFK, and I did a, I did my own little meditation and and invited whoever was friendly to come in. And as we began to land, um, we flew out over the Atlantic to come back into JFK and. A, a huge sphere, silver sphere, gorgeous, beautiful sphere, appeared right at the tip of the wing. I was sitting up in first class. It, it, it was right at the length of the wing, directly out my window. I watched it for a, at least a couple of minutes, wow. um, and it eventually it slowed down, and it just went uh, beyond the tip of the wing. But as the plane turned, it was about 4 in the afternoon. The, the plane, we got into a position where the tail of the aircraft was to the sunset, and as we turned, this ball stayed in perfect position with the airplane, such that I could see the sunset reflecting on one on one side of the ball of the, wow. the silver thing. What year so, was that? So these things was that before uh, that? Well, well I, I it was Super Bowl Forty Eight. I was going to Super Bowl Forty Eight at um, in New Jersey at MetLife Stadium. So that was three. Was that three four years ago? Three. Okay, I can look it up. Super Bowl Forty Eight. Super Bowl Forty Eight. So. Um, but, but these things have continued to happen. So, so for me, what what happened? Um, and I and I've wondered who these who, who these people were. I saw I saw a huge black triangle with three brilliant lights directly over my head out in the Superstition Mountains uh, one evening, and I I was with Mufon people who did not see it, but it was directly very low over our heads. I just stood and gazed at it in in awe. And um, uh, so these these things have happened, and I, I and these things have all looked so different that I I never made the assumption that it was ever one people or one person that was behind it all. Um, so so I, I I don't know how to put it together, Grant. But I did have a dream the night before we left to we go left to where? Chile. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was in I was in Scottsdale, and. Um, uh, I had a very, very lucid dream, and some some really fantastic things have happened at times in my dreams. And uh, if you would like, I can relate this dream oh, yeah. to you. Oh, for um, sure. Okay, well, um, there are times when I, I seem to have out of body experiences, and they're not scary. Yeah. They happen in my sleep, and I have found in these sometimes in these experiences, I have found it really safe to go to Manhattan, and I. I don't know why, but I just feel safe there, the tall buildings. Um, and, and I love the sense of I'm not really familiar with Manhattan. I, mm-hmm. I've been there several times, but I don't know the city. And I kind of like the feeling of being lost. Well, I uh, I was asleep, and all of a sudden I found myself. This is, again, this is September 2016. I found myself standing on a street corner and I had a map because I was I was doing what I loved most. I was just trying to figure out the city. And there were a lot of people standing on the corner with me because we were waiting for the light to shift to change so we could walk across. I vaguely 
um, saw two men standing directly in front of me, and the only reason I even vaguely um, noticed them is because they were both wearing identical suits. They were a dark brown, kind of a dark brown, but not completely dark, but just uh, a, deep, a deep brown kind of suit. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, and I had this map. I was holding it up. Now, why I would have a map instead of my GPS on my phone, I don't know, but I had a map. The light, the light changed, and I began to walk across the street with a map with all these people. And I got to the other side, walking down the sidewalk, and it was... Um, the sidewalk was uh, there was a big angle and there were no there, it was there was a lot of space on that particular corner the, the the building didn't come all the way out to the corner of the street so there was some some space there but I was walking on the sidewalk and as I was walking these two men stopped and they turned around and I put I kind of looked up from the map and Grant they looked uncannily alike they didn't look identical but they looked uh, they looked very alike. And um, <clears throat> one of them, the one on my right, smiled very kindly, and he said, "He said, um, can we help you?" And I was so surprised by the fact that they had never even looked back, and I thought, how on earth did he even know that I was looking at a map that I could be lost? Because I never saw him. I never saw them look at me. Mm-hmm. And so that was my first little tip. I thought, oh my goodness, how did he know that? So. I said, well, I, I'm, I'm just trying to, I, I told him very specifically, because I, I couldn't remember where I was headed. I just said, I, I'm not quite sure where I am. So the man, uh, I had the map with my right hand. He took the map with his left hand, and the other man kind of stood to the side. And they had, they had kind of like blonde hair. It was slightly receded. They had a short nose, a longer lip. And um, he, he took the map, and he said, he pointed, he said, this is where you are on the map. And I became so enthralled with this individual, I couldn't even hear what he was saying. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is happening here? What is happening? So, so I, um, uh, he, he looked at me, and that was when I first noticed his eyes. They, they looked completely human. They were of human height and stature and so forth. Uh, they looked incredibly alike, like they could have been brothers, and but but they looked they looked alike. But his eyes, his eyes were like a deep deep honey amber color. They were not they were not earthly human. They were they were spectacular. They were spectacular eyes. And I looked at him and I thought, oh my gosh, these people are not from here. They are not from here. Mm-hmm. And I remember standing there on the sidewalk. And it took every ounce of courage that I have, Grant, because I'm a little shy in some ways. And I, I kept, I kept saying, Tom, Tom, just ask them where they're from. Ask them where they're from. Ask them where they're from. And finally, I got the courage to to to, to get it out. And it didn't come out where you're from. What came out was, you're not from here, are you? Those were my exact words. You're not from here, are you? And this man looked at me in the kindest smile, and he said, no, we're not. And so instantly, my next question was, ask him who they're from. And I thought, I will never get the courage to do that. And I thought, because I'm always seeming to miss these big opportunities in life because I don't speak up, you know. <laughs> but finally, finally, this is goofy. This is really goofy of me. But I, 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 so I said to myself, well, just ask them, if they're from Missouri or someplace like that, and, and I specifically Missouri is what came into my mind, which was so goofy. So, um, so, uh, so I asked them. I said uh, when I asked them the question because I was so nervous. I just said, "May I ask where you're from?" I never said Missouri. And he looked at me and very confidently. He and I, Grant, I don't know what this means. He said, "We're from a place called Electra." And when he said Electra. The spelling of it came into my head. It was not. It was not E L E C T R A. It was E L E K T R A. I could see the word when he said it. Oh. And um, and and I got the guts. Believe it or not, I got the guts to say, "Is there any chance I could visit where you're from?" And again, he smiled and he said, "No." <laughs> he just oh. said, "No." 
And I said, okay, all right. I said, thank you. And he said, you're so welcome. And he smiled, and the other guy smiled, and I began to walk on. And then I noticed, I just stood there, just, I, I just stood on the sidewalk. I just couldn't believe it. As they began to walk off, I noticed that there were three more of them, all dressed in the same suit, off to my right. And they had stopped, and I hadn't even noticed them. They were off to my right. They had stopped. And when those two guys started walking, they kind of joined them, and I watched them all walk down the sidewalk. Well, that is the dream I had the night before we left to go to Katakama. Wow. So either that's an extremely um, realistic fabrication of my mind, or um, uh, the granted, I, I was alive. I was there. I was, it, it was, I was there. So I, I don't know who they were. I, I kind of wondered if, um, I shared that with Ricardo. And he goes, oh, Tom, it was real. It was real. You know, just, just trust your instinct. It was real. You were there. Um, so but I looked for them at Atacama, and I, I didn't see anybody. You know, and I, I don't know who they were. I, I just assumed they were friends. I, I don't know. Um, uh, so anyway, um, you know, Grant, there, uh, a life, life, when we look through our eyes, it can look so boring and so banal and so every day and so you know the grind and yet life is filled dimensionally with uh, with dimensions stacked upon top of each other and uh, the profundity of of uh, just uh, the physics of our own world is is so so deep and so profound as we go from the macro to the sub micro to the quanta to the quantum level and um I, I'm just uh, I'm just amazed every day that uh, life is not what it appears to be, and uh, that's what I got from that uh, experience in Manhattan in my sleep, and um and and that's what I got from sitting there in the Atacama Desert late at night, and seeing these craft over our heads and seeing this poor Ricardo come down and um and uh, uh when you ask me what does it all mean. I don't know, Grant, but I, I do know that disclosure happens, and it's happening. Uh, and I believe you said this. I listened to an interview with you and Linda and John Burroughs, and you talked about Pandolfi. And so, I anyway, it was a fabulous. That was a fabulous program. Um, I believe it was you who talked about um, grassroots disclosure and I, I really think that's what's happening I, I, I believe that it's um, on the individual level and sometimes uh, people like me are, are, are pretty insignificant I was a business executive I'm, I'm kind of semi-retired but I was a business executive and I worked in a business uh, that had nothing to do with this um, and yet um, because I inquired because I put forth effort things came to me which tells me that not being anybody special, this can happen to anybody who puts themselves into that position. And people like yourself are going to be very susceptible to the experience and, and to a greater knowledge of things because you're putting forth the effort and you're, you're doing it. You're out there. You're, you're exposing. You're opening. You're expanding your consciousness. 